a very good afternoon to everybody joining us aboard here at Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands. Welcome to the Sunset Safari with myself Chad and today on camera we've got the legend himself and Paul and we've just left camp and we are driving through quarantine which is a nice little open area quite close to camp just taking it nice and slowly this afternoon. It is quite uh, overcast here at Juma, which is a blessing. I'm not sweating like we have been over the last couple of days. So I'm hoping that there's going to be a few cats that might be out and about this afternoon. We're going to spend some time down in the southern parts of Juma, driving along some beautiful drainage lines, maybe to see if we can find any tracks of those elusive cats that we have been searching for for the last couple of days. So I'm, I'm holding, th holding uh, thumbs or fingers as some people will say but I'm sure we're gonna have a fantastic drive no matter what we find. I mean there's always something out here to talk about. And just hear a squirrel that was alarm calling. But it is a, a very, very pleasant afternoon here at Juma. So please do also remember that this is a live and interactive show. So please do send through your questions and comments to us. We do enjoy chatting to you and answering all the questions that you have for us. If you would like to join the conversation you can do so on X using the hashtag Wild Earth or you can join the conversation on the YouTube channel or if you would like to become a subscriber you can do so on our app. And I was just saying now that it's it's a great afternoon for the cats to be active. Sorry Nadina, I lost your comms there. If you can try again, please. Oopsie. <laughs> Thanks Mac, uh, I appreciate the, the good luck and yeah we're not going to name those uh, cats but everybody does know what we are talking about but we'll also see maybe if we can find some hyenas this afternoon but uh, talking about being a good afternoon with it being a little bit cool why don't we take a look at the weather in all the different locations. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are here live at Amakala Private Game Reserve where the sun is hot and the wind is blowing. This is a fairly warmish afternoon, but nonetheless we are enjoying it. Hello, hello everybody, welcome. My name is Eric, your naturalist for this afternoon, joined by Morgan who is on camera. And today, well, we are attempting to uh, show you the three amigos, but they appear to be sleeping, uh, absolutely passed out, lying flat, flat, flat. And you can just see one in the center, you can just see a little line in the bush that well, not in the bush, in the grass. That is them in the shade. We know that they're there because when we arrived, their heads were up and oh, they've gone back to sleep.
and happy happy, happy cat day to you too yes this morning i was a little bit disappointed to try to see if we can walk this in place look for these lions but oh there's some movement okay here we go here we go hello hello little you too what they hear the one the one on the right is looking off to the left and the one on the left is looking off to the right they're covering each other's backs and they're fairly safe in this area no problem no too tired put the head down again time for a nap too hot to move around They're not very, well, I suppose I can't really tell. I'd like to know how full your bellies are. Dog men love a good afternoon. Good afternoon, we hope, we, we trust you are doing well. This fine Saturday afternoon. We are enjoying this. It is nice to be able to see these amigos that sometimes we don't always get to get to see them. They like going, they love going into areas where they can disappear just like that and nobody will see them. It's become a bit of a habit for our car. Back to sleep. He doesn't want to be on show today. Although the other brother... I mean, they are lying in a clump of grass. Better is more than a word to us. It's a commitment to conserve our nation's precious landscapes, oceans, and wildlife. It's more sustainable fishing and farming practices, jobs and prosperity for our communities, and access to clean drinking water for all. Better is believing that together we can make a difference. For nature and for you. Secretary Bird has decided to also join us in the same sighting. 
So this tree that you can see that's on the left hand side, that is the same tree that is providing shade for our three amigos. Oh, our three amigos are up now, I think. And that secretary bird, you better be careful there. Although I know this, could, this bird is capable of taking care of itself and not having to worry about this tree. Where did it go? I wonder if it froze. No, it's walking, we just can't see it. Oh, you may not see it. There they are. All three of them. Proof of life. <laughs> What more could we ask for here? There's so much going on. No, I'm not interested at all. One of the brothers. And a prop down. Lovely to see these boys, it really is, you know, given that they make it sometimes quite difficult for us when we do manage to push through and, and uh, get lucky with them. Oh, it really is special. It really is. And I can imagine, majority, not majority, but there'll be a fair amount of guides coming across this side to see if they can't get some viz on these beautiful, beautiful cats. Wait, he not necessarily know. So cheetahs, God met well. God designed cheetahs to hunt primarily during the day. He gave them almost like a pair of sunglasses. So when you look at the face of a cheetah, you can see one of the main dis the distinctive uh, features of them is those lines that come from the corner of their eyes and go all the way around to the side of the nostril and almost down the snout. That is initially like uh, um, what American football players will use. They put those black bands, those black marks uh, uh, on their cheeks just to help with the glare of the sun. Initially, this is what the, the cheetahs do as well. Well, they have these permanent. And uh, this is to help them when staring in far, far distances uh, to identify prey. They can do it with ease during the day. So they are primarily diurnal hunters, but these guys, I know for a fact, definitely do a bit of hunting in the nighttime. And that's not usual for cheetahs. Cheetahs don't usually hunt at nighttime. Though it's not impossible. It's the same way uh, uh, cheetahs climb trees. You know, lions climb trees. It's not normal for them to climb trees, but they do have the ability to do it. Whereas a leopard is their speciality. Oh, one of these guys, I'm pretty sure it was during a nocturnal activities, managed to uh, fracture or break a leg. And uh, it, an operation was, un where, well, an operation went undergo and uh, it was fixed or it was pinned. And then they were put in a, a big boma so that it, he could basically stay off of his paw as much as possible so that it could heal. And uh, it's healed so well that when they are walking, it's actually impossible to tell which is the one that has now injured himself. Um, uh, he's made a full, full recovery, and that's exactly what we needed, as uh, the numbers of cheetahs in the wild is not necessarily where it needs to be. Look at this, this stretch, a stretch. 
He's gonna lie down over there, I'm sure. You're just moving. All right. <laughs> we're going to continue sitting here. In the meantime, we're gonna send you over to Chad up in Juma. Thanks very much, Eric. And it seems like those cheetahs might be doing a, a couple of stretches and we've had an incredible start to our afternoon sunset safari here on Juma, where we've come across not just one, but three rhinos, three white rhinos that are just resting. And we didn't see these rhinos from the road, actually. I wouldn't claim that spot because they are about a hundred meters off the road. But we, as we left that saddlebolt stalk as it took flight, we heard a bird alarm calling um, in this area where we are now. And so we drove into the, the block to see if we could maybe find that elusive cat. And we came across these rhinos. So, I mean, I'm very excited to have been able to bump into these rhinos. I mean, you can see there literally looks like a rock. And all you can see is that ear on the right hand side moving. And I mean, these rhinos are making the most of this cooler weather here on Juma. I mean, it, it is very, very overcast. It doesn't look like it's going to rain, but there's uh, quite a lot of cloud cover. so. I mean, these rhinos, they're just resting now. They were probably resting here throughout the day. And you might find as it does get a little bit later on into the afternoon that they might stand up and maybe move towards water, go and have their evening drink and continue feeding. Prairie dog, they have been uh, it has been, sorry, sighting after sighting. And it's amazing how the bush has offered so much to us over the last couple of days. We're very, very grateful for all these amazing sightings that we've been having. And hopefully it does continue into the next couple of drives that we have. And I was just saying that these rhinos most likely a little bit later on this afternoon might get up and start heading towards water. They are water dependent, so rhinos will drink twice a day. And you'll often find them drinking in the early morning and then in the late afternoon. Often just at sunset, just as that sun goes behind the, the horizon, it's a very good time to find rhinos. And I mean, we've been speaking quite a lot about white rhinos, but Black rhinos, interestingly enough, they, they do most of their drinking at night time. There's a game reserve up in KwaZulu Natal that's done quite a lot of uh, research on black rhinos and they've got a quite a substantial number of black rhinos there. And they've noticed that a lot of those rhinos come down, the black rhinos specifically, come down to drink in the evenings. <clears throat> I also know that James was talking about the rhino deer hornings. <laughs> rhino one, all you need now is a pangolin. That would be amazing. I'm, I'm keeping a lookout, I promise. I wouldn't just drive past one. But with the luck we've been having, you never know what we might find. And, I was just saying before that comment came through that James was talking about the dehorning of rhinos and he found that study in Botswana about they, they did research a month before the dehornings and then a month after the dehornings and they didn't find any um, difference in their behavior. And just to add to that, I worked on a reserve where they had been dehorning for eight years. And in that eight years, they had not seen any difference in the behavior of the rhinos. So, I mean, I know James did do that research on the, um, the rhinos in Botswana, 
but it just shows you that even over a long period of time, the study was Chad done. Hopson come in on the airwaves. Apologies, James. As, uh, as I'm speaking about him, he's calling me. I'll be with you in two seconds. Go ahead, James. And James, just stand by, I'll be with you now. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it shows that the, the long-term study done in that particular reserve, there has been no negative impact, only positive. So it's a, a great thing to do, as sad as it is, to, to see the rhinos with no horns. Um, it's a conservation effort and doing a fantastic job. Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app accessible on both Apple and Android platforms. It looked like he was going to get up. Probably just rearranging a leg there. Looking very nice, like a distinguished gentleman in the grass there. Very comfortable. Scanning slowly on the horizon. Ah, uh, yes, cheetahs and other animals. It's in your name. Of course, of course we win the sighting, especially just for you. Oh, all three of them are up for a bit. What body part is that sticking out in the middle there? It's a foot. It's a, <laughs> it's a back leg. Oh my goodness.
Right, good afternoon and welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari where we are very unlikely to see the sun set at all on account of the fact that there is a thick and very gratefully received uh, blanket of cloud over the low felt this afternoon. On camera today is the great panda, Tagudzwa, Musesani, Billions Glitz. Yes, he likes to give himself a new name every couple of months and retain the old ones as well. So if he lives for a very long time, it's going to be quite tricky to introduce him later on. Our plan this afternoon is to check the northern boundary and then the western boundary. What was that? Was that a darker? We've got a diker here, or a Steinbocken. Yes, and it's gone. Well, it's wonderful sighting that panda. Well done. Yeah, great job. Excellent. It was a little diker that has now run off. A diker is a small antelope. It's known as the part of the dwarf antelope group. I'm not sure if you can say that anymore in the days of woke, but there it is. Hello, Mary. What was your comment? You say, there you are. Is that what you said? There you are. Yes, here I am, Mary. Here I am. I'm hoping that the wild hounds from this morning are going to come back onto Juma and have a restful afternoon with us, followed by some uh, fairly vigorous hunting activities as things cool down. Uh, but I'll take, I mean, I'll take any form of animal, really. I'd really like a spotted cat, however, or a pack of hounds. I haven't seen an elephant today. And that is because the elephants have moved on, as they are wont to do. And as I frequently say, it's very interesting how the elephants are here en masse and then they disappear en masse and I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that the vegetation in an area starts to produce so much chemical defense that it becomes difficult for them to remain and so they press on. That's, I'm guessing. Itzy, you say hello James and Panda. Yes, Itzy, good day to you uh, wherever you are in the world. Panda sends his best regards. He would look at you, but unfortunately he cannot lean forward and grin into the camera without frightening younger viewers. Yes. Panda says he misses the dash cam. Now on the road we have got a troop of dwarf mangusta. There they are. There they're just going to all emerge back out again now. Enjoying a Saturday afternoon here, playing in the traffic. <laughs> Always vigilant for anything that might be about to swoop from the sky and grab them, or slither from the grass and bite them, or leap from behind a bush and swallow them whole. And they're in the process of doing exactly that to any beetle, termite, grasshopper, small rodent, or egg. They like a bit of egg. Panda, these are very unlike you, these mongoose. Do you know why I say that? Yeah. <laughs> they are not vegans. They are the very opposite of vegans, Panda. They only eat animal. They will not take your dinner of tofu, chickpeas, and some form of substitute meat. <laughs> now, the one at the back, uh, it's not that one, it's another one looks to me like an extremely heavily pregnant female. Let's just keep watching there. 
Daniel, this is an interesting question because it's not only a question about mongoose, it's actually a, a question around how we've been taught to look at nature and um, see it. Anyway, your question is, what is the function of smaller carnivores? And there are all sorts of assumptions implicit in that question. Um, I suppose the quickest way to answer your question is to say that um, they fulfill a niche, and that niche, or they don't fulfill it, they, they live, they fill a niche um, that suits them, and that is that they are, it's a niche that contains small, meaty things for them to eat. They live in little termite mounds that are unoccupied. Um, they can operate in the day because they have a number of temporary refuges within their territory that they know very well. And at night they're kept safe in a really rock hard termite mound and it's very difficult for anything to get at them. But the question you ask around what is their role is something that we kind of learnt at school, especially possibly people of my age, a place. Oh, look at that, it's caught a little worm. It's a centipede. Ugh. I'll get back to my discussion now. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a centipede. Now, a centipede can bite and it can sting. But clearly this mongoose is not vaguely concerned about that. Just delighted to have caught this thing and doing its best to get away from the rest. Wow, that's cool. And it'll be operating to a certain extent, or almost chewing it externally, so that when it eventually ingests or swallows the centipede, the spiky bits will all be gone. and it'll slip gently down into the body and uh, become nutrients. That's very cool. Well done, Panda. Nice spot there. Here's one standing like a human. Trying to figure out where the centipede's gone. Anyway, in brief, Daniel, um, I don't. I think it's a mistake to look at animals and nature, and s with the perception that there's some kind of um, role for every animal to play, and um, as if there is a an overall plan. Um, the the best way to look at it is that every available niche out here, and a niche is a kind of <laughs> that's very nice. A niche is a is a space. It's a it's a a physical space. It's a it's a, a menu. It's a way of breeding. It's all those things uh, make up a niche that an animal occupies. And if there is a space, if there is a niche available, an animal would evolve into that niche to occupy it. And I think that's an easier way to look at it because. I find that nature makes a lot more sense then. And I remember sticking on this particular thing topic when I was a youngster, look at that one standing up there in the grass, because I remember that when I was at school, we'd say to teachers, you know, well, what is the role of a mosquito if it's such a terrible thing? And that's the, the standard answer when there was an animal that was apparently offensive, like a, Monopheles mosquito was that oh well it's it's part of the food chain that's its role and in actual fact it's just evolved to occupy a niche in which it can be successful there yeah. I think this one's pregnant. No, it's not that one. Sorry, Panda. I don't know where she's gone. She just looks so heavy around the belly. And she's got a shorter tail than the others.
All right, I think we'll move on from our little miniature carnivore sighting and we'll go and see if we can find something else while you go back to Chad and his magical rhinos. That is an incredible sighting, James, that you're having over there with the mongoose and the worm. Um, a kill on a Saturday. What a treat. But we've just repositioned now to see if we can get a, a better view of these rhinos and not to disturb them. We took quite a big loop around and it is quite a dense area where these rhinos are. So we've just decided that this little window is probably the best window that we're going to get without disturbing them. And maybe if Paul can just zoom in a little bit, it's, we've been discussing now how it must feel to have a red-billed oxpecker climbing into your ear. <laughs> that red-billed oxpecker has been adamant for probably the last five minutes or so to go into this rhino's ear. Seems like it's the only one that is sticking around. And I can only imagine the, also how many ticks must be um, in that rhino's ear or around that rhino's ear. It's a nice soft tissue around the ear where those ticks are then able to latch onto. But I mean, that rhino is also not going to be able to get those ticks off by itself. I mean, it might be able to rub up against a, a tree to try and get rid of them, but the best way to get rid of them is the red-billed ox picker. So sometimes it, the rhino will let the red-billed ox picker go in the ear for maybe five or ten seconds and then moves its ear. I can only imagine how ticklish that must be. It's just amazing to spend time with these magnificent animals. I mean, there's nobody around us. We can't hear any vehicles. It's just us and the rhinos and feel very, very blessed to be able to just spend time with them and not disrupt them at all. They're just resting and sleeping. Happy days for them. Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app, accessible on both Apple and Android platforms.
Ooh, there's a little bit of movement, some licking, some grooming of each other. Very sweet, very sweet. But uh, there has not been much movement there. We haven't really missed much here. Oh, there's a bit of a paw movement. Poke him, poke him with the paw. Of course, your brothers. They've definitely come closer to each other. They're not necessarily lying on top of each other, but they are very, very close. So it's very difficult to tell who's lying where, unlike earlier where we could tell where the three brothers were. It's now three cheetahs have made one big cheetah altogether on the floor there. They've merged into one. Once again, always, always lovely to see these gentlemen. As uh, we don't always get to see them, but uh, I mean, they also, sometimes we see them and it's just only a little bit of the head, a little bit of the eyes, sometimes half a face, but now we can see majority of the body as well as the occasional head and ears when they do pop up. And I think we are incredibly lucky. Incredibly lucky indeed. I mean, there's so many places where they could have gone. They could have gone just over the crest of this hill, which would have made it very, very impossible for us to have put them on screen. Now, I will remind you that we are live and interactive, so please, please, please send in your questions, send in your comments. Like I said, we love to hear from you. We love to hear the questions. So you can do so by registering on our app where you can make some comments, get involved in the conversation. If that doesn't work, you can always go across to Twitter where you can use the hashtag Wild Earth tag or you can also join in the conversation there. You can also go on to YouTube where you can also join in the conversation in the comment section there. As well as subscribe with the bell notification so that you don't miss any action whatsoever. You can get updates and all sorts. Uh -huh. Hello. He's hearing some birds chirping. I also heard them chirping and he's put his head up. Right, so just keeping tabs on the, the surrounding. Like I said, cheetah are always in danger of being taken out by other animals. Um, more so the lions. Now they don't know where the lions are. We know vaguely, very vaguely where they are. Um, <laughs> As the crow flies, they are very close together, but there's a series of fences and gates and tunnels that they've got to go through and past in order to get to us or get to these guys. So they're fairly safe, um, but never, never a bad idea to keep a lookout. Right, we're going to send you over to James up in Duma. Well, here we have got some fairly unmistakable a animals. There are elephants, in case you were wondering. Uh, if you weren't wondering, they're having a drink. It looks like two bulls, I think. And they're enjoying a drink, unfortunately, north of our boundary. So we are visually trespassing. but I'm sure the owners won't mind. <laughs> I mean, I suppose there's a certain aesthetic value behind this shot, given that they were standing at exactly the same angle, but 
I'm hoping they're going to turn around and come this way once they've finished their drink. And this is a waterhole known as Baobab Dam, not Boabab Dam. Cheeky baby Ellie, you say that you are pleased to see elephant bottoms. You're alone in that, I'm afraid, cheeky baby Ellie. They do seem to be performing some sort of slow powder de turning gently at the same time from side to side. The one on the left is looking fairly fixedly at something. Let me just see if I can have a look. Apparently it's a it's a hippo. <laughs> yes, I think that's exactly what it is. There's also a, a leonine log across the way. Maybe, apparently this is where the wild dogs were last night, so maybe they're hiding somewhere around here. Yes, I suppose it's possible. Except that I'm pretty sure that they were um, the ones that we saw this morning. And by we, I mean Chad. Very peaceful, very muted kind of afternoon song. A couple of virtual starlings. And way up above me I can hear some European bee-eaters. but otherwise all is eerily silent. Hmm. Right, I believe that Eric's amigos are now up and moving, so let's go across to them and I'll... <laughs> Oh, these cheaters, they really know how to play the game. They, <laughs> this was literally five seconds ago. For mm, maybe two minutes, that cheater was standing, he was stretching, he was walking around, he was looking around. Five seconds before we go live, he plops down into the grass, cod disappears completely. Oh, oh, oh. No, no movement. Maybe his brothers will follow. Mm -hmm. That's your cue. That's your cue to follow him. No? Okay. No, he's going to remain seated there. I think what's getting them to move is uh, the sun is obviously changing its position. And therefore, the shade is also changing its position as well. So I think they are finding themselves lying in the very, very warm sun. So they've got to get up and move. Largely appreciated if you did too. Definitely warm, you can see they're panting. Uh, we'll say that there is a road close by with lots of cars traveling on it the weekend and we can hear them, so we do apologize for that noise. You can see that they are hot. The mouth is open. You can see the head bobbing back and forth. There is panting for sure. Hello, here we go. Okay, let's have a look, see here. The belly doesn't look very full. So it does look like they could do with a meal. Are you looking for a nice patch of shade? Oh, that looks like a nice patch. Oh, look at that. That's very dark, yes. Yeah, very good shade there. Where well, they're lying is very close to the base of the tree, so uh, not much shade. You see that other brother there, you can see the sun is on his face. 
And I mean, we're sitting in the sun. We are warming up here. It is very, very warm. I can't imagine how much warmer they are with all that fur. Sandy, how often do we find the three cheetahs running around together? Um, if you're asking if they stick together all the time, the, the answer is yes, they go absolutely everywhere together. Um, whereas when they are hunting every now and then, they, uh, they will... Well, not when they're hunting, you know. They have this, these little kind of playful bursts where they <laughs> are chasing after each other. It's really funny. Um, but sometimes it's ca it can be not annoying but difficult because then they go running off. Because they're so fast, they disappear. And then we have to try and relocate them, and that can always be a difficult thing if they decide that they're going to go and sit down or lie down. Trying to find lying down cheetahs is not always the easiest. Um, we could have easily driven past them here this afternoon if we weren't able to see part of a body or a little bit of an ear or if they weren't sitting up. But I think we were the first vehicle to come past, so they were a little bit, well, the first vehicle to come past since this morning, so they may have been a bit curious, so that's probably why their heads were up. We've got a refreshing splash of entertainment this March. Africam is surfacing with a new show. Join us every morning and submerge yourself in nature's ambiance. Watch it live and transport yourself to the finest watering holes across Africa. Wild Earth, connecting with nature. And uh, yeah, without that tree being there, I don't think we would be able to have seen these boys. We don't know where they would have chosen to lie. 
they actually probably would have continued further down this road until they either got to the houses or past the houses where they may find a little bit of shade. But even that shade is also a eucalyptus shade. There's not much. Maybe little bushes where they could go and disappear. Maybe somewhere behind us or something like that. They really are fast asleep now. I'm still waiting for this one brother who's lying in the sh in the sun to maybe get a little bit too warm and then he'll move off. Welcome back everybody, um, so left those rhinos and we've just dri driving along the southern boundary of Juma and we came across a herd of elephants that crossed the road quite quickly. I can still see one or two off in the distance but we're not too far from a water hole. So I've got a feeling that these elephants might start heading towards that water. I'm not 100% sure how long it will take them to get there but I think it's worthwhile just going to spend a little bit of time at the waterhole waiting for these elephants to come down to drink it would be quite incredible if we are able to see them coming down to the water it also gives us a nice opportunity to just sit and listen for any alarm calls in the area and where we're coming up to now is actually also where the Nkuhuma Pride crossed out of Juma this morning. So you can maybe hear if there's any alarm calls for them. But also that elusive cat that we are still looking for. So I think that's going to be our plan for now. And just sitting, relaxing at a waterhole. Waiting for that beautiful herd of elephants to come down to drink. And it's happened to me before where I've said that to guests on Game Drive and the guests were all for it. Yes, let's go do that. And we sat at the waterhole for an hour. No elephants and went back to where we had last seen the elephants. And literally they had turned around and gone back from where we had left them. So it was... Uh, yeah, it was a little bit sad, but you know what? That's the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. So we are coming up to the waterhole now, but for now we're going to send you back over to James with some interesting impalas. Well, we've managed to find some impala. Uh, quite a large herd of them. And they're enjoying the feast provided by the Thamida triandra or red grass that we have out here and although there's a lot of grass around these impala um, it's not the stuff that you can see that they're eating they're getting their heads right down and going for the leaves that are close to ground level it's a bit of a blustery afternoon still pretty hot and muggy. <laughs> Melissa, I'm afraid you'll have to put that question to one of our Australian viewers. I don't know if all eucalyptus trees make the same oils or smell the same. Uh, we don't get them here. Remember they're, well, I mean, we, we do get them here. They are grown in parts of South Africa uh, for wood and for paper, timber. But we certainly don't have them in the 
game reserves and they don't grow indigenously here. So I, I have no idea, I'm afraid. My knowledge of eucalyptus trees is scanty at best. Interesting question that, Melissa, thank you. Now that young chap is just past his first birthday. Very pleased with himself. And it's well worth at this time of the year just looking out in these herds for unusually small lambs. And that's because there will be that secondary breeding season or secondary birthing event that occurs in February. And I think I don't see any here, but for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there is a, a secondary breeding season for impala sometimes that occurs in September when some of the ewes who were not impregnated during the May effort uh, have been or, or are impregnated and in fact it's the only time I've seen impala mating. I've never seen them do it at the time when most of them do it and those young lambs would be born around about now. Very few. I think it's something like five, just less than five percent. So it's always quite fun at this time of the year to see if you can spot a small baby impala that is smaller than all the rest. Can't see any of them here. Here we go. Chad said about three days ago that he saw a baby impala, a tiny newborn, three days ago. So there you go. And the legend goes, of course, that, and there will be guides probably spouting this very legend as I am spouting it to you. It will be being told in all seriousness. Uh, around various spots in South Africa, that the impala uh, has the ability to hold back its young. And I've read this in blogs from fairly reputable places, uh, from guides who will tell the story that the impala have the very rare ability to be able to delay birth and give birth only when conditions are favorable. This is, of course, garbage. And it's possible that the legend occurred because of the secondary birthing or breeding season. Mm, you can see how flexible they are. This is quite interesting. And I've, something I've mentioned a few times, well, I mean, we've been doing this as long as I have, it's quite frequent that I mention things I've mentioned before. Can you see how flexible the impala is at turning the head towards the back? Um, but it's flexible only in that kind of horizontal plane. And if you, it's one of the reasons that the predators out here can frequently catch and kill bigger and heavier prey. And I, I you know, I've, I've actually never read this, but I've, it only dawned on me fairly recently, and it, which means it must have dawned on other people long before it dawned on me. But when a leopard, for example, takes down an impala like that, they jump on it and they bite the neck. But the imp I've, I've often watched them and wondered, why don't you just stand up? Because surely, eventually, you know, that, that cat wouldn't be able to hold its own weight by its, its mouth the whole time. And the reason is they can't. Once they are on their sides, they're not flexible in a sort of twisty way like a cat is. And they can't stand up unless, if you know, if their heads are at the wrong angle. So they can't twist the spine sufficiently to get their legs underneath them and stand up. 
And you see that with impala being killed by a much smaller leopard. You'll see it especially with lions that kill something like a zebra. So a, female, a lioness, big lioness, weighs 120 kilograms. A good-sized zebra weighs well over double what she weighs. And a lion, single lioness will relatively comfortably take down a zebra. And once the zebra's down on the ground and she's kind of pinned it there, it's very, very difficult. Or pin the head at a certain angle, which is flat on the ground. It's very difficult for the zebra to get its legs underneath it and then sort of stand up and push the lion off. So although we're looking at them and thinking that's very flexible, the it's flexible horizontally, but as soon as it's required to twist that spine, it's not particularly supple. On safari. Now remember, this is live and interactive, so we'd love to hear from you. To be having these incredible experiences in this wild underwater forest. It, it was just one of those things which I don't think I'll ever see again in my life. Thanks for joining us on our sunrise safari. Right, so as you know, our mission is to join the world. Well, the, the, our mission is to uh, uh, join the world and wildlife together. And the way we do this is we require help. And if we would like to help, what you can do is you can go over to our website where you can make a little donation where your donation will go towards equipment, technologies and all sorts of other stuff that we need in order to make this possible and bringing you bringing the world into the nature environment and we'd also like to thank everybody who has gone ahead and donated your donations are very much thank we thank you what well, we are very thankful for such and uh, would not be able to do such without her As well. not showing signs of movement so I think what we may do is we may move off and 
come back a little bit later and see what they've got up to. And just as I say, yeah. Welcome to back to Juma, everybody. Where we were just now sitting at Twin Dams, and we're waiting for that herd of elephants to come down to the water. And while we were relaxing there, just having a quiet chat, we actually heard something killing a warthog so jumped straight back into the car and we drove to the the boundary and literally where the tracks of the Nkuhuma pride went into little gauri this morning we stopped and we listened and we can faintly hear lions feeding so i'm uh, pretty certain that the Nkuhuma pride have just killed a warthog in little gauri and we we just now sitting on the boundary waiting where there's quite a nice little water hole or a little pan and to the left hand side where they could maybe come and drink after they finished this warthog and also just behind us is twin dams there's a much bigger water source that they can go drink at so unfortunately it's not on Juma where they have killed this warthog but we might just sit here a little bit I mean we know that there is a herd of elephants close by that might be coming down towards the water there is potential for these lines to come out of the thickets that are in front of us to come towards water and we we know that lions often like to drink after they've finished and a pride of 10 lions feeding on one warthog there's, it's not going to last too long. I mean, even if it's quite a big warthog, 10 lions feeding. Might be a little bit too faint for you to hear at home, but they are definitely fighting over that carcass. Literally directly in front of us past this leadwood tree. That and Paul is currently on at the moment but while we were, were sitting there my adrenaline at first I thought it sounded like monkeys having a fight and then it went on for a little bit longer and I thought no that's a warthog dying unfortunately for that little warthog but the lions did at least get a small little meal I'm sure they're gonna be back up and on the move a little bit later looking for something more substantial to eat maybe a wildebeest or a zebra or even a buffalo this pride is very very well known for taking down buffaloes so if they come across a buffalo bull they will definitely let me see if i can go forward sorry there's a hyena that's about to cross the road up there. I'm pretty sure that hyena's en route towards where those lions are. You can see how oh, it's just standing still, listening, trying to pick up which direction those lions are in. And I'm no expert, but I do think that is the, the wrong way, hyena. This is actually exactly where June and her cub were yesterday. In the, the heat of the day, they were wallowing in this little puddle close by to where we are now. Man, oh man, I do wish they killed this warthog on Juma but it's just one of those things it's a it's nice because it's a open system and the animals are able to move 
in and out as they like and we only have a certain traversing within this area we respect all the the rules of the sabi sands so we'll just stick on the boundary road and spend a little bit of time here waiting maybe i'll try and see if i can get hold of one of the rangers from the other lodge and just see what's happening there maybe if it's a smaller warthog it will be worthwhile waiting to see if those lines do come to the water Yeah, while we sit here and just wait a little bit, we're going to send you over to James and see if he's got an update that side. I would say that Chad is um, going to wait on the southern boundary for quite a long time because I think those lions will eat their poor little piggy and then lie down and go to sleep. It will probably be enough to put them to sleep, yes. <laughs> We're now going past the Gauri repeater. I'm just going to quickly show this to you because some of you will find this relatively interesting. Others of you will not. For those who do not, I apologize. Excuse me. For my audio. Sorry about that. Anyway, that um, tower there is where the signal from the vehicle goes. And from there, it goes from that sort of um, white dishy thing towards the left. It travels from there to the sort of final, final control room in our camp. And then from there, it travels via the internet to you in your homes. Well, no, first it travels to the final control in Johannesburg and then it travels uh, to you in your homes and that whole process I think takes between 20 and 40 seconds. So I'm in fact living in the past when you hear my voice by 40 seconds. If only you could bet and make money on that. Like I think people actually used to, I think I may have mentioned this as well, they used to bet on, bet on cricket games and that sort of thing. You have somebody at the game and somebody betting based on the live feed. Um, Judy Ditchfield, you say, how about finding Marib, said the male leopard. Judy, I'd love to find Marib, said the male leopard, but I think that he's moved on. I don't think that he's coming back to Juma necessarily, not while his father is around. I mean, I would, I just don't think the day can come too soon uh, for his father to go elsewhere to ply his trade. His father is, I mean, he's a very fine leopard, he's a good looking leopard, he's, uh, he's fathered a lot of children, but as a TV leopard, he's hopeless. We've made mention of the fact that he's getting better with vehicles and he's more tolerant of vehicles, but alas, I have not found that to be the case uh, in on a consistent basis. Okay, I'm waffling about nothing. Let's go back to Chad. He's managed to find some elephants. Thanks very much, James, for being quite quick there and sending the feedback over to us here at Twin Dams. And I was speaking a little bit about the, the elephants might come down towards the water. And as we left the boundary, we saw these elephants coming down towards Twin Dams. And it's a beautiful herd of elephants. There's a youngster that we might get to see in just a little bit, a very, very small calf. Are just spectacular. I love spending time with uh, herds of elephants. It's 
It's nice also. I'm just going to keep quiet as these elephants do walk towards us. I'm just going to move a little bit just because there are some youngsters within this herd. And Paul, I'm just going to move. Just because the, there are some younger ones and I'd hate to get in the way of them. So let's just give them a little bit of space. Allow for them to go where they like. At least now they can decide where they would like to go. I mean, we, we were parked on the dam wall, so they were walking directly towards us. And they, there's only one way to go straight past us, and there wasn't enough space on either side. So that's why I've just opened up a nice little space for them, just so that they can go about towards the water. Oh, they're going to head down towards the water. Where do you think is best just to go onto the dam wall? Yeah, I want this step. Okay. So I'm just going to allow for all of them to go down towards the water. Sure. And then I will go up onto the dam wall. There's just one more that's uh, stay behind. Let's go. I think I'm going to drive that side and turn around. I'm just going to drive to the other side. It's just going to be a little bit easier to view these elephants drinking. If you just bear with us for 30 seconds, it'll be well worth it for sure. But how cute is that uh, little baby elephant, the calf? It seems like it's all happening down here around Twin Dams this afternoon. Out in the wild, life moves fast. To capture the action, you've got to be in the right spot at the wrong time. Now, incredible animal behavior, selected from amazing amateur and professional footage to reveal the secret lives of animals in motion. This is raw nature caught in the act.
brown raptor and we were doing birding 101 this morning and I thought we'd carry on with it this afternoon. I said this morning that uh, a good time to start birding is in the winter because if you see a brown eagle it's a tawny and this of course is not a tawny eagle it's also not migratory but it's not a true eagle and if you look it's got a very fat head now I know people with fat heads and um, they're fat figuratively and literally but this one has got a literally fat head and a relatively kind of um, I suppose s slight beak and it's also got hairless legs and therefore as it flies we bid a fond adieu to the brown snake eagle brown snake eagle okay well, you got that there a panda you won't forget again hey the brown snake eagle you must write it down Right, good. MC is writing it down. So, uh, for those of you who've just rejoined us, we were looking at a brown snake eagle, which has now flown away. And I don't know what it was looking for to eat. Perhaps there are a whole there's a whole nest of vipers around here that they were it was hoping to have at. Yet again, this road, the road of nothing aka Monkey Orange Road has uh, played true to form but for the brown snake eagle which was pretty much sitting over another ro road yes, I must say this it's a universal di disappointment this road there's the brown snake eagle he's just up ahead you'll see, you'll see him there Panda and that's why there's a squirrel alarm calling to the left of us <laughs> It's seen the brown snake eagle and thought to itself, Oh, goodness gracious, let us get inside. This is a very uncooperative brown snake eagle. A pox on it. Yeah, it's gone. Anyway, at least it was an animal, right? Let's carry on. This road has got another 75 meters before I am able to, um, sorry, I've just been shocked in my ear. I hadn't realized this, I'd forgotten it. Steve saw Maribse the male leopard on the 29th of February. Of course he did. I still think that he's moved on. I don't think he's going to come and live here again unless his daddy moves off. He may well take the vacant territory occupied by, or the previously occupied by Tavangumi. Actually, let's go up this way. Which was to the north of us, which will mean that we'll see him relatively frequently. For those of you who don't know, Maripsa, the male leopard, uh, we have watched from almost birth. Uh, we had an, uh, we've, yeah, he was one of those cats that, whose histories we followed extremely closely, with great joy and relish. And now he's got to the age that he has to go off on his own. Pop down to what is known as a treehouse dam. See what's happening there. After which I suppose I shall have to consider my options because my plan of finding wild dogs the side of the reserve have gone for a, the proverbial ball of chalk. I'm hoping desperately a leopard will step out onto the road in front of us.
Right, well Chad is still waiting at Twin Dams hoping the lions are going to come across and maybe there are a few more elephants there. Let's go and have a look. Thanks very much James. Enjoy your bumble down towards Treehouse Dam. So those elephants that we had at the waterhole, they did have an extremely quick drink. Um, they drank at the water and then they moved off and I was just quiet in that last little segment just to allow all the viewers to listen to the hyenas calling and I'm pretty sure that those hyenas were calling because of the kill that is here not too far from us inside Little Dowry. So we are going to stick within this area uh, where we are at the moment because uh, I do I would like to find those Inkahuma lions coming on to Juma maybe towards Twin Dams to have a drink or if they do come towards that water hole the small little water hole not uh, not in Juma but close by then we will still be able to see them apologies about that there's just a, a vehicle that's maybe on their way towards one of the lodges here in the Sabi Sands we are on a boundary road so sometimes that does happen vehicles passing us this is maybe why they So this is why that vehicle was stopped up here, just a young elephant bull that's maybe trailing that herd that we were just with. Amazing to see how he uses his feet also to kick up the grass to try and get all the necessary roots and nutrition out of it. But as we do sit with this elephant bull Let's send you over to Eric at Amakala to see what's up happening. Right, so we're here on this particular... Eh, excuse me, let me try that again. We're here on this particular road, um, and this is where... Our oh, lions were okay. If there are people who are not big fans of blood and carcasses, I would advise you to maybe look away now. There's a warthog carcass over here. Oh, mm, there's the fresh smell of that. Um, this was made, I'm not to show, sure, early this morning, during the morning safari, or sometime last night. I'm not too sure, but there is pretty much nothing left of it. These guys have devoured all of it, or most of it. I mean, it's a very small warthog for... <laughs> um, well, it's not, six, it's not seven lions, because we know that the male lion is somewhere in the base and somebody saw his tracks there this morning. So I'm assuming this is six. All of the females and the juvenile male. So if they, if this caucus is here, then they got to be somewhere around here. I'm just going to have a quick look around. And see, maybe there's a little bit of movement. Maybe we can see some chubby kitties lying underneath a bush. But because of the heat, the best place to look now is only shaded spots. Shaded spots and in trees, not in trees, I mean in bushes. That would be our, our best sort of point of investigation here. As uh, it is definitely still too very warm to be lying out in the open. 
maybe a bit later. So, I dealt with it <laughs> correctly, leaving nothing left. They uh, oh, completely stripped that carcass clean. Even took a few ribs off. Very nice meal. Just gonna take a slow bumble now to take the time to really, really have a look in the bushes. Because it'll be on days like this where they will lie in the bush. Not next to it, inside of it. Come out, come out, wherever you are. I promise my intentions are good. We're gonna continue having a look around here, scanning in this, this area. We're gonna send you over to James, who's made his way over to Treehouse Dam. Well, we've come back to the dam where Dewey the hippo is playing with his stick. And the reason we've come back here is, well, because we were hoping to find some interesting animals. But also, Gerrit, who as many of you will know is a camera operator in our, in our lives, the head camera operator and part-time uh, metal worker, he says he has seen a hippopotamus that does this elsewhere. So it's not the only one. And in fact, it's in this area, up north near Palabora, a lamentable settlement, which obviously has a fairly interesting hippopotamus. There we go. Go, Dewey, go. It's like he's been sat with that thing in his mouth the whole day. Come on, Dewey, give us a display. That's it. <coughs> Open wide. I didn't realize this, but apparently this hippo has been playing with the stick since 2018. He's been doing this, must have been started on the dam cam and so he's not that young anyway while we wait for him to do something useful uh, over to the western side of the waterhole is a saddle build stalk there we go I mean it's not the best picture of a saddle build stalk you'll ever get but what's interesting is the saddle build stalk is alone and normally they'd be in couples. This one has turned its back on us. Looks like a female. I think I saw a flash of yellow around the eyes. Uh, thank you, Linda. Yes, you say, ah, Dewey and his stick. Yes, Dewey and his stick and his new friend, Sarah the saddle build stork who has lost her husband for some reason. Maybe he ran off with a, another woman. Maybe he was taken out by a leopard. Maybe he's just watching the Six Nations at a pub somewhere else. Um, 
Interesting question from Nadine in the final control room. Would a leopard eat a saddlebill stalk? Uh, yes, Nadine. I don't know if it's ever been photographed, but a leopard will eat anything that it can catch, really. And there are records of leopards actually in ground hornbill breeding sites. The ground hornbill chicks are secured in really quite thick wire meshing and there are records of lepo leopards sticking their claws through the wire meshing, getting their claws into the birds and actually pulling them out through this very narrow meshing. So they will happily take on a bit of feather and uh, sparse flesh. Yeah, there's a dear female. You can see that from the yellow ring around her eye. And she finds herself without a husband. Our march to freedom is irreversible. This really is precious. We don't always get to get close up to these birds like this. You know, birds of prey are, you know, as as on top of the food chain as they are, and as much as they're not targets for humans, they still fly away like they are. And uh, there, I suppose in some places there are people that do catch these birds of prey. Um, and they will use them for all sorts of things, for trading, for falconry, and for having as pets. Having wild animals as pets is something that I don't think is a very, very good thing. That's why we call them wild animals. You have domestic animals as pets, and you have wild animals to look at. Yes, 
so, so a treat indeed. Indeed. This is a, a uh, pretty cool burst they see in infrared. Sorry, not infrared. Ultraviolet light. Oh, look at him stretching. Oh, yes, here's a good stretch. Um, they see an ultraviolet light, meaning when the, a rat or mouse, well, mostly mice in this part of the country, when mice go into their middens, just like that heron was watching, and they come out and they do their, you know, drop their scat or urinate outside their burrows, it glows like purple. Does it glow purple? No, it glows that uh, almost glow in the dark color where you can see it. So these guys can identify where all the urine is for these mice and it will make its judgment based on the amount of urine, how fresh it is, when a mouse would possibly pop up and they will hover above the hole. Until the mouse comes up, to which point they will dive like a kingfisher, swoop down with great speed to snatch up that mouse or mouse and fly off with its target. Really, really cool birds. And I believe they are monogamous. And they find a partner, they pay for life. Oh, TC, I'm glad. I'm glad you are. This bird is, oh, this is uh, one of the nicest sightings I've probably had with these birds. I don't think I've ever had a, a a black-winged kite sit for so long, so patiently with us, they generally tend to move off fairly quickly or move off before we even get a chance to turn off the road. This one allowed us to idle next to the car, think about it, and turn off the road, sit here for another two minutes, and then decided it's going to sit tight there. Oh. I'm seeing him stretching his or her wings, and I'm wondering if they're maybe not getting ready to start some hunting, as the evening is some of the best times to also do some hunting. Evening, early morning for these mice. I can see you wanting to start moving, it looks like it. Uh -huh. You turned around. And also, before we went live, I watched and did a little bit of a, a poo. And that's generally when birds do that. Oh, the big stretches. When birds generally do that, they're making themselves lighter, meaning they're about to fly off. When a secretary bird does it, know that you have five seconds before that bird is taking off and leaving, vacating the area. Oh, why did you turn around? Because this is definitely for sure not your good side. We were really seeing you. We were getting your good side. At least we can still see the head and the beautiful red eye. Very distinct white head, red eyes. Are you about to jump? He looks like he maybe wants to climb to a higher spot. A higher perch. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you up to, my man? Oh, he's making calls for sure. I wonder if there's not another one close by. something hovering. He 
it's possible I can see the mate in a very distance. Nikita, we've got to get a lot closer. It will be small details. Both males and females generally look the same. Um, that's why when I've been referring to this specific member, it will be he or she. As uh, I'm not too sure if the difference can be told from so far away. Maybe I could be wrong. If there are any bird experts in the the viewer group, please do correct me if I am wrong. But uh, from what I understand, both male and female are very, very similar looking. Uh, you generally find them open grasslands, savanna areas. You find that's where they do most of their hunting on the grassland fields. Um, often also in uh, the thicket areas. I don't think I've really seen many of them in the thicket areas. Uh, you mostly see them sitting on top of acacia trees. Um, not acacia trees, sorry, uh, sweet thorns, um, sweet thorns, common quarries, basically a perch where there's a nice branch almost at the top of the tree where they can see fairly nicely um, to basically have a, a great view over most. Quite fascinating that you can actually find these birds all over Europe and as far as uh, India as well.
<laughs> so we we did leave the last area where the Nkuhuma Pride were, um, just a little bit further south from Juma, and we went to go and see if Dewey was at Treehouse Dam, and we caught up with James at the water. I'm sure all the viewers did see us there. But now we we are on our way back towards the direction of where the Nkuhuma Pride is. It's just starting to get nice and cool now. The chances of... So I just got hold of the ranger that is there and he said that there's nothing left. It's only the head of the warthog. So the chances of them now getting up and starting to move is quite high. So I don't want to be too far from this area in case they do if they do start to move but uh, we're gonna send you over to James for now he's got beautiful battalions well here we have got some battalions yes two battalions enjoying a Saturday afternoon chinwag on the old log now the question is what are they talking about? It's very difficult to say. That is the male who's looking at us. Now I'm assuming the other one is a female, but it's possibly not. We'll need to see the bottom of her wings. Yes, it is. So that is Mrs. Batelier slightly further away from us and Mr. Batelier closest to us. He looks quite, quite a stern fellow. Not much of a sense of humour. In fact, they both do. They both look like they take life very seriously indeed. If you watch carefully, you can see that nictitating membrane that passes over there eyes frequently and plays the same role as blinking does for you just cleans the cleans the eyeball it's quite eerie isn't it so they can close their eyes obviously they sleep with their eyes closed but they will use that membrane to clear the eye of Now, hang on a second. That that alier there, the one we're looking at, looks. In theory, the male shouldn't have that tawny kind of um, that tawny nape to his neck. Only the female should have that, but the female should have white on her yeah on her greater covets i have heard that you can get kind of both in other words males that do have the, the tawny on the back there but this is quite interesting might be a young female she does look like she's getting a little bit white there no she doesn't Oh, I wouldn't stay for certain that I can tell which. I cannot say which I, young battalier this is. Uh, Nadine asking if this couldn't be. Uh, I'm not sure I like this name, but um, one of. <laughs> we named a young battalier Batavia. I don't know why we named it that. Anyway, uh, couldn't this be young Batavia? is the question and the answer is no because remember the adult plumage takes seven years and if my recollection serves if my memory serves me correctly Batavia would only be about three and wouldn't be colored anything like this well I'm gobsmacked I'm going to have to actually read this characteristically seen 
Male, when perched, flight feathers appear black in, in flight. Second reason in the primary is black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When perched, primary show pale grey wing panel. Yes, in flight. Second reason in the primary is light. Largely white and narrow black trailing edge. Blah, blah. Fish paste, fish paste. Yeah, it doesn't say. Anyway, I, uh, I'm not sure what to tell you. I'm still pretty sure that's the male. And that's the female on the right. Also, the female is bigger. See that? Oh, hang on. I've got more. Here we go. We've got more information here. This is the male. Head and neck black. Erectile cowl. Yes, yes. Mantle, back, rump and tail, chestnut. Oh, mantle, back, rump and tail, chestnut. Scapulars and greater upper wing covers black, lesser and median wing covers grey brown. Okay, so it can he can be chestnut on the back. Oh, I see. Oh, you know what? I missed a tiny little bit of um, a tiny little bit <laughs> of uh, important writing here on the caption to the image, which says "cream morph, very rare." So that's the male. And the female is on the right. Uh, an incredibly long-winded winded way of sexing these two bateliers who have yet to crack a smile since we've been here. And so I think that we shall press on. We have probably milked the sighting for all it's worth. And on we'll go. OK, Panda? Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, in intellectually stimulating segment, I'd say. <coughs> it sure is, Rosemary. You say it's always a lovely sighting seeing the batelier. It sure is. A hyena has been lying here on the ground and we heard a hyena calling not long ago. I wonder if there isn't a hyena around here somewhere. Hmm. I would have said from precisely around here. Now, um, I am reliably informed that there are two places left on the private safaris with Steve and me and Cedric on the, well, Cedric and Steve are going to Chitwa at the end of the year, and I'm taking one to Ungala, 15,000 hectares of the Timbavati, and that's in May and June. Uh, and we're going to look for the white lions of the Timbavati and various other marvelous things. And if you would like to book yourself a, a, the last two seats, travel, at wildearth.tv. Travel at wildearth.tv. Come on a private safari. It'll be lots of fun, a good laugh, and hopefully we'll see some amazing stuff. Travel, .wild Earth, travel at wildearth.tv for more details, or just go to travel.wildearth.tv, which will take you to the website. Thank you very much, and that's all. We'll go past these pans again, see if there's anything going on. We had a hummer cop here this morning. It's all starting to feel rather quiet at the moment. 55 minutes left to find something extraordinary. Like a leopard cat or some doggies on the hunt. Make sure the radio is up. I think Chad is still hoping desperately that his lions are going to come across. Yeah. As Nadine says, all the action yesterday happened within 19 minutes. Or within 30 minutes of the end. Now, here is a very confusing situation to me. In the top of that tree is an adult batelier sitting on a nest, right? Now we are very close to the other bateliers who are also adults and 
they're supposed to be very territorial. I'm just quickly, you yeah. know, aggressively defends territory year round. One male had a circa 21 to 40 square kilometer home range. Territorial displays include diving at intruders, presenting talons, and occasionally striking on the back. Initiated equally by both sexes, but intrasexual encounters most frequent. So I don't really understand what's going on here because the others are very close by. And this is another adult. And I thought that I'd seen three in this area. In fact, we've seen all three on the same tree, I remember now. Maybe one of them is just a really old youngster who won't leave home. That's possible. Well, there we go, and Steve said we once had two males sitting together, um, it was probably around here. Maybe they just have a, you know, an unusual family arrangement. We don't judge these days. Not a nuclear family as such. Open relationship. I suppose as long as the little chick grows up in a loving home, all will be well. This is On Safari. Now remember, this is live and interactive, so we'd love to hear from you to be having these incredible experiences in this wild underwater forest. It, it was just one of those things which I don't think I'll ever see again in my life. Thanks for joining us on our Sunrise Safari. Maybe panda socks. What do you think, Mpo? Panda socks will give me good luck. Maybe I wear one, you wear one. <laughs> Maybe that will be the good luck charm that we need.
sorry Nadine, what was that? Okay, I believe uh, Cedric has a leopard scarf, so maybe I'll also ask him. Well, Cedric will be back on drive tomorrow morning, so hopefully he's going to bring us some nice luck. So we, we just drove, there's a, a fly that's been bugging me for the last 40 minutes, can't get away, but we just drove now the eastern boundary of Juma just to see if there were any tracks from during the day. I didn't uh, see any, but now we're going to start heading back towards the central parts of Juma where there's a lot of uh, beautiful, thick, dense drainage lines that these leopards might be using. I mean, with it being nice and cool, I mean, yesterday, this time, it was still extremely hot. So today is very cool. I mean, it's probably still 28 degrees, 27 degrees, somewhere around about there. A little bit humid. But a nice cool breeze that is blowing. So it allows for the nocturnal cats to become a little bit more active earlier on in the the day and we're hoping now is the right time for us before i did head out this afternoon before james presented on safari i, I said to him i said james where are you going to be driving this afternoon and james's answer was probably on juma so i just uh, laughed it off and off i went on my merry way so James and I have just been driving around all different parts of Juma currently, seeing what we can find for everybody sitting at home. I do hope you've got your preferred beverage of choice, as well as some good snacks. And just pretending that you are now on safari with me, sitting in my vehicle enjoying the the sounds of wendy and enjoying the african bush with us looked like there was just some elephant dung from one elephant in the road there but didn't look too fresh so not worthwhile following that. Okay, while we continue bumbling around here on Juma and seeing what we can find, I'm going to send you over to Eric and see if there's any updates on his lines. So, our update with our lions we were unsuccessful with that one we will maybe try we'll try again tomorrow morning maybe they're in a better place i think it's just the you know the heat has pushed them into the bushes and it will take a while for them to get a little bit active but uh, we suspect by the time they get active we will be long gone excuse me now, we've got an Impala and we're hoping, well, so far so good, he's managed to stay on screen for us as he's feeding. And uh, this will be a fairly oldish ram. And ram is a male, the male Impala, for those who don't know. 
quite a beautiful one. Yes, I'm talking about you. Yes. And um, he, uh, it's he is by himself. Well, we think, we suspect he's by himself. I haven't we haven't been here long enough to know that he is definitely by himself and that there isn't others probably lurking behind the bushes over there. But it wouldn't be also the worst, well, not the worst thing. It, it wouldn't be impossible for him to also be by himself. It's very, very possible. You know, sometimes males that get kicked out of harems um, or get pushed out of harems by other bigger males, stronger males, uh, sometimes they, they have trouble trying to find bachelor herds instantly. So they sometimes tend to stick to themselves. He's looking at me like, <laughs> we've committed crimes here. He looks to be in great condition, so I don't think he's sick or anything like that. Quite often, sometimes animals by themselves, especially males, well, sorry, especially females, uh, when they're by themselves, they are sick. Yes, you are not sick. Uh, we've discovered that. They'd look at us like that. He's a bit worried. But, um, no, he looks very, very healthy. I was looking at his belly earlier. But a very, very decent sized belly. Yeah, now I'm talking about your belly. Yes, you. You've got a big belly. Nikita, they don't. But I'll tell you a story about an Impala. His name is Stumpy. Stumpy uh, is a very good example of why we don't fight. <laughs> Stumpy, uh, fully grown Impala male, uh, got into a bit of a tussle with some other maybe other Impalas, and uh, the tips of his horns broke off. That's why we called him Stumpy. Stumpy then proceeded a year later after acquiring this nickname. Again, caught fighting. We didn't see who he was caught fighting with, but he definitely was fighting, and uh, he broke off his horn completely on one side. So now he is a unicorn only having one horn. But antelopes do not lose their horns. Deer do, but antel uh, 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 antelope retain their horns permanently throughout their life. It's part of their skull. So underneath the, the, the keratin sheath, which is the dark part of the horn that we see, there is actually bone that is infused, and there he goes, infused <laughs> into the skull, and then the keratin sheath on top of that. Whereas antlers are something that grow seasonal with the mating season for deer, and then fall off during the non-mating season. I've often wondered how much of a mission or how much of an inconvenience those antlers can be to something like a, um, a white-tailed deer. You know, white-tailed deer, I mean, they have these massive, massive, massive kind of like, almost look like chandeliers almost on top of their heads. And, you know, they go maybe half the year or so. I don't actually know. I'm assuming it's about half the year without these horns, and then all of a sudden these things grow onto their heads and all of that weight. I mean, they definitely get the size of like a kudu's horns, even bigger. You know, and the kudu's horns are heavy. Those are very heavy horns indeed. So I wonder how much strain it must put on a deer's neck growing those antlers. Oh, he appeared for us and then he disappeared. Was it the belly comment? Is that what made him disappear? I wonder. I wonder. We had some birds going absolutely crazy here now. And bog my kiddies. They've now flown away, but I was too busy in a story. Out in the wild, life moves fast. To capture the action, you've got to be in the right spot at the wrong time. Now, incredible animal behavior, selected from amazing amateur and professional footage to reveal the secret lives 
of animals in motion. This is raw nature caught in the act. must relocate they will reunite sorry wrong word but um i find that pretty cool you know you don't find very many antelope that uh, actually have ways of uh, reuniting with each other that way pretty clever i think and the impala will bronk when they for the same reason that a, a springbok pronk they will bronk when they feel that uh, when the, when they feel that a predator is coming to the area and they want to show the predator, look, listen, you chasing me right now, don't don't even waste your energy. And then they do that whole bronking thing. Now bronking is two legs on the ground at any given time, two legs, back legs, two legs, back legs. My apologies. And then when a springbok pronks, it's all four legs, four legs up in the air, and they bounce, ding, 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 and then the bit of impala kind of rock like a, a rocking chair pretty cool actually and um i love watching impala bronc you know they have these specialized suspension in their legs same as the springbok which allow them to do this bronking and the bronking Now I'm driving so fast because I haven't managed to find anything. I was given a four minute warning that I needed to find something for this segment and I'm afraid uh, uh, no luck. It's feeling very quiet and uh, lonely out here. Anyway, we will keep trying. We have 35 minutes. Um, we had, did have some interesting information from James Richard who sent through uh, an article he'd read about the bataliers and the fact that an unpaired adult may well hang around with a paired adults or a set a pair of adults and just sort of hang with them and not get involved in the nesting at all or in the raising of the youngsters so I think that's obviously what we've seen I think that's quite nice really they were having a little chat together obviously while uh, mum was checking out the house oh. two males having a chin wag it was <laughs> yes, probably a bit old school that really 
anyway, nice to have solved that mystery to a certain extent. Now we're on the northern boundary. I've decided that we need to go to the far east to see if there are any tracks there. Donna, you want to know if I can check on the wigs on the spotted eagle owls that hang around in the big drainage line that runs through Juma. Uh, Donna, I have been past the wigs recently and I'm afraid there is no indication that they are nesting. It is the wrong time of year. Although I have heard of them nesting at this time of year, certainly the last time I went past there wasn't any sign of a, of a nest. Now, if you do lose us briefly as we go through here, apologies, we'll be back as soon as we get through this dip. Well, thank you, Barbara. You say I shouldn't feel lonely. You are all in the back seat with me. Well, that's good to know, Barbara. We've got some birds on the road there. Some starlings. If Panda will bring the camera to bear on them, the Canon XF605, well done. Oh, a mixed flock of birds. Look at that, Panda. Franklin to the left. Casting aspersion on the starlings. Looks like Natal spur fowl. I think. Is that as much as you can give me, Panda? Is that all you got? There we go. <laughs> yes, Natal spur fowl. And then some rather magnificent red-billed oxpeckers. There they are, having a little dust bath there on the road, which is nice. Uh, Nadine just asking if we should uh, put this on the highlights reel because it is so astounding. Uh, Nadine, yes, I think that this will be the highlight of tomorrow's On Safari show. Uh, long-distance view of two red-billed oxpeckers on a road and at a particularly unfriendly Natal spurfowl chasing off a virtual starling. And I suppose they're probably on the same road because there is a little collection of ants. It is quite cool to see them having that little dust bath. Bit of a birding day, really. Apart from those two elephants in the distance and the rhino this morning. Cedric will be back tomorrow, so maybe he'll have a little bit more luck. Oh, now doing exercises. Off you go. It's a sprinting Natal Spurfowl, and now a stopping one. I don't think this is a very nice bird. He seems to be chasing everyone else off. Because he needs to learn that he will one day be very lonely. And he will rue the day that he chased off all his friends both within and without his species. Let us carry on, Panda, after that lesson in how not to win friends and influence people. Was that exciting, Panda? It was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm surprised. Uh, you've never seen something like that, and I'm surprised you even managed to contain yourself and not just shake with excitement. Well, well done. That's what comes with experience, you see. Now, without your experience... And uh, I know. Uh, can I find you an impala in a tree? 
Well, unfortunately, so far, no. But I am scanning every tree I go past. And if there is an impala hanging in one of them, I shall be sure to stop. You got stung by a bee? Are you afraid of bees or are you allergic to them? Afraid. Afraid. Not allergic. Just afraid. No, then I have no sympathy. I think it's on me now. That was very funny. I suddenly heard and saw out of the corner of my eye uh, this very shaky movement. Oh, there's the bee. There it is. Are you afraid of them? Have you been stung by one before? You have. And still you're afraid of it. I mean, it's not the worst pain in the world. Right? Anyway, there's a bee flying around our car. So I drive quickly to get rid of it. All right, we're going to check the water hole over here. And while we do that, we'll head across to Juma, and uh, not to Juma, to Chad. I don't think he's managed to find anything either. Huh. Morn. <laughs> I know I'm laughing, but uh, good luck, James and Panda, in trying to get rid of that bee in your vehicle. I did actually just pass James and Panda without them knowing that I was there. But uh, I thought James was down in the southern parts and now we're a little bit further north in the property. The second time lucky to find James on drive. But we are still just bumbling around seeing what we can find but it, it has started to become a little bit quiet. There's not too much movement of animals around the areas that we have been driving. So we're changing it up a little bit, heading into different areas and hopefully this area that we are heading into is an area that James has not been into today. And even if he has, you never know what's come after you've driven that specific road. And there's been a couple of times before where I've driven on a road and a ranger will drive five minutes after me, not even, and there'll be something that's popped in the road or you'll see tracks crossing over your vehicle tracks. So it's quite incredible how, I mean, if you do think about it, it you've got to be extremely lucky. You've got to be in the right place at the right time in order to see Yeah, so I mean, you you got to be extremely lucky to spot whatever it might be. Just as you look there, you see the movement and you know, okay, there's something wrong there. And I believe yesterday Cedric was at that waterhole where we found the wild dogs and not too long after I was at the same waterhole and the dogs were there. So luck also really does have to be on your side. We're coming up over quite a nice little rise now and yesterday as I was coming up over here the, there was a beautiful sunset out over the Drakensberg mountains to the west but today is very very overcast so we're not going to get any sunset whatsoever. Maybe tomorrow we'll, is another day and we can maybe get a nice beautiful sunset tomorrow. Whenever I drive past any road, I always have to have a long stare and just make 100% sure that there's nothing coming down the road towards us. I do just want to give a, a quick shout out to two of my very good friends. They're actually heading off to the UK on Wednesday and it's their farewell tonight. So Sky and Donut, good luck in the UK. Hope you have fun and you'll definitely be watching me when you get there, missing Africa. 
But uh, for now, let's head over to Eric and see what the update is. Have a look, we are back with our three Amigos. Yes, indeed we are. And they are somewhat on the move. Off to a bit of scent marking, but it's cooled down nicely for them. So, uh, they can be on the move. Oh, are you coming right towards us? Hello, come and say hello to the lovely viewers. That would be nice of you. It would be quite nice of you to come say, oh, yes. Keep coming this way, big boy. Oh, he's gorgeous. And the other one is up. Okay, if you could just lie down right there, that would be perfect. You don't have to pass us. You didn't hear me, did you? No, you didn't. Okay. You're gonna walk straight past us here now. So where are you guys going? What is the... Uh, where is your GPS taking you? Is no one gonna tell me? Okay. That's fine. Just know that I'm going to be following you. How cool is this? And there's another one right here. He's also about to find oh, all three of them. Now this will be the bigger one of the three. This is the the believed cousin that is read that is joined up with this group. And uh, they are well, they were joined and put they were uh, what is the word? They were kind of put together and they've formed this coalition now and they are having well they have the strongest bond ever so yeah pretty pretty cool and they are behind us at the moment and uh we've got this lovely 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 sunset going i think this is the perfect way to have ended our cat -a day don't you think so Oh, the fourth of me. Oh, oh, you're too kind. You, you really are. And I'll, I will take that. No problem, because I. Uh, oh, Cheetah happened to be my favourite cat of all time. Cheetah, and then Caracal. The smaller cats. Those are the nice ones. Don't get me wrong, lions are awesome. Lions are pretty cool. Cheetah are quick. Slender. Awesome little kitties. If you are a driven nature enthusiast with a background in communications, then this message is for you. Wild Earth is calling for volunteers to moderate our web and social media chat platforms during our live broadcasts. Do you keep up with the latest trends on social media? Do you have quick fingers and a sharp eye? Then we're looking for you. To apply, email your CV to us at jobs at wildearth.tv. Join the Wild Earth team today. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
Oh, right. So, yeah, once again, I do apologize for two things. One, the road is very, very noisy. It is now Saturday afternoon. There are lots of people driving around. And then secondly, our uh, three Omegas have disappeared down into the reed bed. Very close to where we were. So we are just going to wait for them to come out to the other side. There is no visibility on them. In the meantime, we have a beautiful, beautiful scenic landscape for you. This beautiful golden hour and uh, lovely, lovely East Cape Savannah grassland. This is what we get to see on a daily basis. We feel, well, I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky and incredibly privileged to be able to do what we do in the environment that we do it. Stella, I love talking to animals. I know <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that think I must be this crazy, crazy naturalist. And what is he doing talking to these animals? But I don't know, I feel like I was saying to one of my friends earlier that uh, my true personality comes out when I'm with animals. But talking to them, it kind of makes me sort of understand them a little bit better. Not that they can reply. I would love oh, the day, the day scientists have that technology that we can talk to any animal and they can reply back to us and we can hear them. I'll be the first in line. But uh, it kind of, I don't know, makes, makes us feel that they are not an object. They are more something that we, we appreciate in a sense. But by talking to them, they almost become not like pets, but they have that same sort of personality and that uh, um, uh, association with pets that pets have with us, in a sense. I hope that makes sense. There was a lot of rambling in there. We're going to send you over to Chad with a hyena and we're going to see maybe if we can't relocate on those three males, if possible. I just wanted to try to get a little bit closer to this hyena. There you can see. So we've, we have found at least a nocturnal animal, or mostly nocturnal. It isn't the same hyena that we saw earlier or oh, we heard calling. We're in a completely different area to that one. So I'm sure this is also one of them part of the Juma clan. Hopefully we'll be able to get an ID on it shortly. But we'll try and stick with it, see where this hyena is going. At the moment you can see it's in no rush. I mean, it's just walking along the road keeping those ears out and I mean those ears are almost like the satellites or tunnels and it can pick up any noise quite far away so like for instance with the when we heard the warthog getting killed I mean those hyenas most likely were quite a distance away and they then heard the squealing and that's why they then came into that area to go and investigate and see what was going on. This is a very strange animal, but such a crucial animal, part of the nature and around. We don't have an idea of this hyena just yet. Maybe let's try to get a little bit closer. And I mean, they're able to clean up all the, the scraps that are left behind by leopards and lions and cheetahs and things like that, even wild dogs. 
and without them you would get rotting carcasses around you'll see a lot of dead animals and things like that so they play a very important role within the ecosystem i mean not just hyenas jackals maybe we can get an id now see how the hyenas now just sniffing the ground I wonder what maybe walked there. Maybe it was that elusive leopard. Maybe another hyena. I'll just have to wait and see. Maybe it was another hyena that maybe was scent marking. They, they do what we call an anal paste, um, often on grasses next to the road so maybe another hyena had anal pasted there and I was just smelling it making sure what was going on there thanks very much Anne I'm glad you love the Juma hyenas and I've actually been also having quite a lot of luck with the hyenas in the last couple of days we've seen quite a, a number of them so it's nice to try and familiarize myself with the Juma clan and it might take a, a little while to get used to their names and identifications but I am trying my best We're just giving this hyena good space, not pushing it off the road or anything like that. You can see this hyena is not in a rush to get anywhere. Happy just strolling along the road, waiting for any opportunity that it could potentially go and hunt or maybe go and scavenge. Better is more than a word to us. It's a commitment to conserve our nation's precious landscapes, oceans, and wildlife. It's more sustainable fishing and farming practices, jobs and prosperity for our communities, and access to clean drinking water for all. Better is believing that together we can make a difference. For nature and for you.
I think I'm gonna start up and get us back to the road and then we will continue bumbling around seeing if we can find anything else Well, it was a nice uh, surprise to find. Just that hyena wandering by itself. And it's amazing, they've got lots of different calls that they are able to communicate with one another. If I'm not mistaken, it's somewhere around 40 different calls that they have to communicate with one another. They're able to then call each other and if there's hunting opportunities or if there's a carcass and I mean, we heard that call earlier on when there was that kill happening. Amazing creatures, hyenas. That's really pretty much it. We've got five minutes to hopefully find a spotted cat but luckily Eric is still trying to keep up with his spotted cats and we'll head straight across to him if he manages to find them. We'll have one last look at the waterhole near our camp. Maybe the hippos are there and perhaps a bird or two. See. Do you see anything astounding? I see two astounding things. There are some hardy dars. There was a fly trying to live in my ear. It's now dead. There we go. Beautiful picture there, Panda. Thank you. That's it. Look at them. Three Hardidar ibises. The nemesis and greatest, four of them, and greatest enemy of any father who has tried to put his baby to sleep. Because you will find one of these things, inevitably, that will shout its lungs out as the child finally stops crying. What a way to end the day. I will tell you that I've seen the Egyptian goose and it's one gosling now here. And uh, I'm afraid I know that some of you are very sensitive when I say things like this, but I don't think Egyptian geese are very good parents. I mean, they're as good as they need to be, but they make a lot of babies that are devoured by other creatures. What have you got? Monitor, is it? Oh, well spotted. Look at that. Speaking of devourers of goslings, monitor lizard. Very nice panda. Well spotted. Let's see if he pops up. He can't breathe underwater, so he must pop up somewhere. I think he probably knows he's been spotted. Good spot. Let's go back to the little family of Hadedas. And to the uninitiated, this bird is also a bird that you do not want to be around if you have a blinding hangover on a Sunday morning because this bird will come and sit on your roof and again shout its lungs out just just when you're dropping off and that horrid pain in the back of your head is receding. <laughs> now, as I was saying before Panda rudely found a monitor lizard, we have 
I think, two parents and two youngsters here. Um, and I suspect that they're from this recent breeding season. And you can see that they are gular fluttering quite spectacularly, which means that they're still very hot. <laughs> All right, I'm going to look you in the eye once more for today. Panda is going to give you his thumb once more because I know you love to see his thumb. And we'll end the drive on our hardy dars there. I will tell you that there is a water thick knee close by as well, but I couldn't bring the camera to bear on it. I think it was just at the wrong angle. Well, wherever you are in the world, I hope that you have a good evening, or if you're in the Antipodes, a good morning, or if you're in the United States, a good afternoon. And if you're somewhere in the Middle Pacific, well, a good tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> we will see you then, tomorrow. Bye-bye.